Hello everyone. Welcome back to Act of Learning. Our discussion in this video will be about one of the classical problems in geometry known as the Apollonius problem. Posed and solved by Apollonius of Perga, the problem asks us to construct circles tangent to three given circles. In its most general setting, any or all of the circles may have zero radii thus reducing to a point or may have an infinite radius degenerating to a straight line. depending on the relative spacing between the given circles the problem may have anything between 0 to 8 solutions though the problem has attracted the interest of some of the finest mathematicians in history it was joseph gergon's elegant solution that settled the problem once and for all unlike other solutions before him his idea solves the complete problem with a single method and that solution is the subject of this video two ideas play a key role in understanding gergon solution one is the power of a point theorem and the associated idea of constructing equal tangents from a given point to three given circles the second idea is a reciprocal relation between poles and polar lines with respect to a circle one of the fundamental theorems of geometry that is important in the apollonius problem is the power of a point theorem given a point p and a circle c consider any line through p that intersects the given circle at two points a and b now the power of a point p with respect to this circle is given by the product of the distances pa and pb this theorem tells us that the product is independent of the line chosen specifically if we draw a line tangent to the circle with p as the tangent point The theorem tells us that PT square equals PA times PB. Therefore, for points outside the circle, the power of a point is just the square of the tangent's length. This theorem enables us to find points whose power with respect to two given circles are the same. In other words, the set of points from which tangents of equal length can be drawn to two given circles. It's easy to find those points. If the two circles intersect as a direct consequence of the theorem any point on the line joining the intersection points will have the same power with respect to both the circles a line like this on which any given point has the same power with respect to the circles is called the radical axis of the two circles in case of non intersecting circles we can draw an arbitrary third circle that intersects both the given circles then using the same idea as before the point of intersection of both the radical axes gives a point which has the same power with respect to the non intersecting circles if we now draw a line that passes through this point and perpendicular to the line joining the circle centers it is easy to show that the power of any point on this line is the same for both the given circles therefore the line that we just constructed becomes the radical axis The radical axis is interesting because if we draw a circle centered on the axis with radius equal to the tangent's length an inversion under this circle leaves both the circles unchanged in case the circles intersect and the inversion center falls inside the circles the said inversion just flips the circles along the radical axis In case of three circles, the three radical axes, one for each pair, all meet at a single point. This concurrency between the radical axes gives a unique point whose power is the same with respect to all the three circles. If that point is outside the circles, then tangent from this point to all the three circles will be of equal length. This point is called the radical center of the three circles and is fundamental to Gergon's solution of the Apollonius problem. Just like before, inverting on a circle centered at the radical center with radius equal to the tangent's length keeps all the three circles fixed in place. Again, in case the circles intersect and the radical center lies inside the circles, the inverted circle gets flipped around the radical axis but otherwise remains unchanged. This leads to a nice insight. 
If we happen to find one circle that is simultaneously tangent to all the three circles, the inversion we just described produces another circle that is also tangent to all the three circles. Moreover, because the tangent circles are inverses of each other, the points of tangency with each of the given circles are also inverses of each other. As every point and its inverse will be collinear with their inverse center by definition, we can see that each pair of tangent points will be collinear with the radical center. This is our first step towards the solution of the problem. Even though we don't know the solution circles yet, we have some idea on where the solution circles touch the given circles. To complete this idea, Yagan developed the concept of poles and polar lines. Before we proceed further, here are some of the important properties that we have seen so far. These play a vital role in the next steps of the solution. Now, on to the idea of poles and polars. Given a circle with center O and a line that intersects the circle, draw tangents at points where the line intersects the circle. The point of intersection of these tangents is defined as the pole of the given line. The same way, the polar of a point outside the circle is given by constructing tangents from that point to the circle. Then, the line joining the tangent points gives the polar line of the set point. In general, the polar line of a given point P is a line whose closest point to the circle's center is the inverse of P. And the pole of a given line Q is the inverse of a point on the line that is closest to the circle's center. What makes them more interesting in the context of the Apollonius problem is, if a pole of a line lies on another line, then the pole of the second line lies on the first. Also, if the polar of a given point passes through another point, then the polar of the second point passes through the first point. Both these properties are easy consequences of the fact that the inverse of a circle passing through the center of inversion is a straight line. Now that we have covered the relevant ideas, let's begin with a simple problem of constructing a circle mutually tangent to two given circles. Given a pair of circles with centers C1 and C2, we can draw a pair of straight lines that are externally tangent to both the given circles. The point of intersection of these two tangent lines, called the external homothetic center of these two circles, is special as it can be seen as a center of scaling that scales one circle to the other. If we draw any line through the external homothetic center intersecting the first circle at points A and B, then the same line intersects the second circle at two points, say A' dash and B'. Dash. Because E acts as the center of scaling, it is easy to see that the triangle C2 A' dash, B dash is just the scaled version of the triangle C1 AB and that the corresponding angles are equal. If we now extend C1B and C2A' dash to meet at P, it is obvious that the angles PBA' dash and PA' dash B are equal and therefore the lengths opposite these angles in triangle PBA' dash are also equal. It is then clear that a circle with center P and radius PB will be mutually and externally tangent to both the given circles. We could as well have extended C1A and C2B' dash and used their point of intersection Q to construct another circle that is internally tangent to both the given circles. Drawing a different line through the homothetic center, we get new points of intersection and thus a different pair of tangent circles, giving a family of circles, each of which is either internally or externally tangent to both the given circles. Even though we have an infinite number of mutually tangent circles, this is just half the story. For the same pair of circles, we can also draw a pair of straight lines that are internally tangent to both the circles. The intersection of these two tangents, called the internal homothetic center, is also a special point in that it acts as a point of scaling that both scales and flips one circle onto the other. Just like the case with the external homothetic center, any line through the internal homothetic center intersects the given circles at points which define a new pair of circles that is tangent to both the circles. Again, different lines give different tangent circles, thus giving a family of circles, each of which is externally tangent to exactly one of the circles and internally tangent to the other. 
we now see how each of the homothetic centers creates its own family of circles tangent to any given pair given a third circle each of the family represents the potential circles that solves the apollonius problem the idea that makes the homothetic centers even more useful is that the homothetic center lies on the radical axis of any two circles from its own family that is its power with respect to any circle of its own family remains the same we will prove this for the internal homothetic center the proof of the external homothetic center is analogous we know that we can use any line passing through this center to create a circle tangent to the given circles let i be the internal homothetic center a and b be the tangent points we are interested in proving that the power of ia with respect to the tangent circle which is ia times ib remains constant to prove this consider one of the common tangents passing through i along with the tangent points p and q we know that angle ipa equals angle p b dash a because of the alternate segment theorem as i is a homothetic center it is clear that triangle pab dash is similar to triangle qa dash b which makes angle qba dash equal to angle pb dash a finally because the line segment aq subtends the same angle at both the points p and b we know that points p a q and b lie on a circle by the converse of the inscribed angle theorem using the power of the point theorem in this newly created circle it is immediately obvious that ia times ib equals ip times iq as the tangent circle was arbitrarily chosen we know that the power of the homothetic center i with respect to the tangent circle remains a constant it's not hard to see that the power of the external homothetic center with respect to any circle in its own family also remains the same this means that the homothetic centers lie on the radical axis of any circle from its own family we now consider a configuration of three circles taken two at a time each pair of circles gives two homothetic centers giving a total of six points interestingly just four lines covers these six points each of these four lines is called the homothetic axis of the given circles it is easy to prove this based on what we have seen so far consider a pair of circles that is tangent to all the three circles because the tangent circles belong to the same family generated from the first and second circles their homothetic centers lies on the radical axis of the tangent circles just like we saw earlier similarly the tangent circles also belong to the same family generated from the second and third circles therefore their homothetic center too lies on the radical axis finally the tangent circles also belong to the same family generated from the third and first circles which clearly means that their homothetic center again lies on the very same radical axis this not only shows that the three homothetic centers lie on a single straight line it also shows that that straight line is in fact the radical axis of a pair of circles that are tangent to all the three given circles this shows the importance of the homothetic axis in the solution of the apollonius problem It is now time to attack the main problem. Given a configuration of three circles, we first construct the radical center. Secondly, we construct the four homothetic axes of the given circles. Let's take one homothetic axis to demonstrate Gagan solution. This one, for example. Based on our discussion so far, we know that this homothetic axis must be the radical axis of a pair of circles that are tangent to all the three given circles and those two circles are inverses of each other under an inversion centered at the radical center for the same reason we also know that the points of tangency of the solution circle with each of the given circles are inverses of each other under the same inversion and each pair is collinear with the radical center there is a little peak at the line we are talking about along with the corresponding pair of solution circles gagan's idea is to somehow construct this line 
for now we only know that this line passes through the radical center if we could find another point that lies on this line we could use that point along with the radical center to construct this line to find that imagine tangents to the first circle at points where it touches the solution circle it's easy to see that these tangents are also tangent to the solution circles it appears that the intersection points of the tangents lie on the homothetic axis but let's prove that it really does we know that the length of the tangents between the point of tangency and the intersection point is equal because they are tangents from the same point to a circle so the point of intersection is a point from which we have equal tangents to the solution circles in other words that point has the same power with respect to the solution circles this clearly means that this point must lie on the radical axis of the solution circles which we know is the homothetic axis that we just constructed in case all of that went way fast let's go through this one more time consider the points of tangency between the first circle and the solution circles we imagine tangents at these points along with their point of intersection these two tangents will be equal in length and are simultaneously tangent to both the solution circles and the first circle as the length of the tangent from this point to the solution circles is the same we know its power with respect to both the solution circles is equal this means it is a point on the radical axis of the solution circles which we know is the same as the homothetic axis by construction the point of intersection of these tangent lines is the pole of the line that we are interested in we have thus established that the pole point of the required line lies on the homothetic axis by the reciprocal relation between poles and polars we therefore know that the pole point of the homothetic axis must lie on the required line this crucial idea gives the second point that we have been chasing so far the solution then is simple construct the pole of the homothetic axis with the first circle draw the line connecting this pole with the radical center the line intersects the first circle at two points which are points of tangency between the solution circle and the first circle repeating the same procedure for the second circle and the third gives us the other tangency points as we now have three points for each of the solution circles it is simple to construct the required circles in case the line joining the pole of the homothetic axis and the radical center does not meet any of the circle we we'll immediately know that we have no solutions corresponding to that homothetic axis now that we have completed the first homothetic axis we can then choose each of the other homothetic axis in turn repeat the same procedure get two circles every time giving a total of eight solutions for the apollonius problem The beauty of Gagan's solution is multifold. Firstly, it solves the problem using Euclidean construction, unlike Adrian van Roman, who solved the problem using intersecting hyperbolas. Secondly, it solves the generic problem with just a single method, unlike Vh, who solved the problem by splitting it into 10 cases. Finally, much of its elegance comes from minimizing the number of decisions, unlike Newton's solution. which needs multiple decisions along the way to completely solve the problem even amidst all this it's still a nice challenge to correctly draw all the solution circles for a given configuration and i thoroughly enjoyed the journey hope you like the discussion as well see you in the next video